Друзья, всем привет, это WineLix. И сегодня мы подготовили для вас подарок. Мы перевели на русский язык, поставили русскоязычные субтитры с одного интересного видеосюжета, который был подготовлен нашей коллегой, австралийской видеоблогершей, которая пишет о вине. Ее зовут Дебра Мейбург. И один из сюжетов, который, собственно говоря, нас заинтересовал, посвящен одной из виноделин острова Тасмания. Итак, надеемся, что этот наш пробный опыт вам понравится. Ну и, как обычно, будем признательны вам за обратную связь. Смотрите. До свидания. Hi, I'm Deborah Myberg, and I'm in Tasmania, about to interview Jeremy Dineen of Joseph Cromie Wines. Jeremy, where is the winery located in Tasmania? So we're at the southern point of the Tamar Valley, and the Tamar Valley is the, I guess, the, the northern region of Tasmania. So Tasmania is a, a triangular island, and the Tamar Valley roughly runs uh, sort of north-south, just to the east of the center of the island. So we're about 50 kilometers inland from the sea, and uh, slightly higher altitude than some of the other um, wineries. A little bit cooler overnight, but uh, yeah, long, cool ripening season. So what advantages does that bring to the wine? The cool nights uh, and the, the long growing season help us uh, get, um, I guess, a, a slow natural development of flavor and retain lovely crisp natural acidity. So the wines have a, a, a natural balance without us having to interfere very much with it. So you make sparkling wine, but you also make a delicious Pinot Noir. Yeah, well, Pinot Noir, I guess, is, uh, is our speciality. It's what we grow and make the most of. Uh, and, and we try and make Pinot that is, uh, I guess, distinctly Tasmanian and, and across uh, three different uh, ranges or styles. Um, so we're from a, a bright, fruit-driven, um, almost unwooded Pinot Noir to your more traditional Pinot Noir with lots of whole bunch ferment, uh, 12 months in, in French oak, uh, and then through to a far more savory and I, I guess more, uh, more complex style as well. So what would you describe as distinctly Tasmanian? What, what constitutes a Tasmanian Pinot Noir style? For me, it's the, uh, those distinct fresh red berry fruits, which tend to be more on the red berry spectrum than, than some of the other warmer Pinot growing regions, which tend to give you sort of dark cherry or almost plum kind of flavors. Uh, Tasmania's distinct uh, forest berry, red cherry, wild raspberry, those kind of flavors, and this sort of lovely subtle spiciness and a real fresh um, sort of crisp acidity, which, which gives the wines a real liveliness. So it all sounds too perfect. What are some of the challenges in the Tamar Valley? The challenges, like any marginal grape growing region, is cool seasons, occasionally uh, having you know, bad weather or wet weather uh, leading up to harvest. You know, all these things can be managed, but I think one of the things about growing grapes in, in any marginal region is the variation from one vintage to the next is much greater than, than in a warmer region. But when when you reach the peaks uh, in those vintages, that's, that's something really to strive for and it makes all the, all the hard work and, and the tougher vintages worthwhile. What would be, say, your three favorite vintages for Pinot Noir from Tasmania? 2005 for me was undoubtedly the best vintage of the last decade. Mm -hmm. Probably 2000 and, and 1998 before that. Um, so we're probably due for another really good one pretty soon. I mean, there's, there's been some other, some solid vintages, but for me, 2005 really was a standout. It was almost perfect growing weather. Um, it just, everything happened on the right date. The harvest was easy. Everything was beautiful and clean. And the wines, in the best vintages, the wines are the easiest wines to make. So. Mm. Everyone always looks at Pinot and then they look toward Burgundy. Um, how does that make you feel? I guess Burgundy is the traditional home of Pinot Noir and a lot of people try and emulate uh, what Burgundians are doing either in the vineyard or in the winery. I take a slightly different philosophy. Uh, our soil is not the same as Burgundy, our rainfall is not the same. Our temperature, our climate is similar, but you know, we're, we're not going to get exactly the same characteristics as Burgundy, so I'm not going to use the same management techniques and I'm not going to try and emulate those same fruit characters. So we use some of the same 
winemaking techniques we, we learn and we trial from, from Burgundy and from other regions. But I really want to focus on the flavours that come from our vineyard, from our particular piece of dirt that, that really uh, you know, showcase uh, a time and a place. All right, so. Jeremy, you're making me thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we've got Pepic and Joseph Cromie. Yeah, so Joseph was a Czech immigrant to Australia, uh -huh. a typical Australian story, um, uh, a penniless immigrant who's done uh, very well for himself uh, in, the, in the wine industry. Um, and Pepic is the traditional nickname in the Czech Republic for men named Joseph. So being Joe's nickname, this is our, um, I guess, lighter, more bright, fruit-driven style. So. I noticed you put one of the wines in screw cap and it looks like the other... Oh no, they're it's, both in screw cap. Yep, it's just a fancier screw cap. <laughs> <laughs> How are the markets responding to screw caps? Pretty well. Um, there's, there's still some, uh, some hesitance in some regions, mm -hmm. but and we export to maybe 12 countries around the world and some of them will only accept screw cap wine, mm -hmm. particularly um, Canada, mm -hmm. um, Sweden, like they won't touch anything with cork. Uh, we had a bit of hesitance in China to start with, but once you explain the, the reason that we've, we've gone to screw cap, I, mean, I, I would never use a cork for another one of my wines again. Uh, we've you know, once bitten, twice shy, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the screw cap helps us retain the freshness, uh, those, those beautiful red fruit aromas, uh, and it ensures that when the customer finally receives the wine, or if they've stored it for you know, one year, five years, 10 years, that you know the wine will be in good condition. You, you're not relying on essentially a lottery of, uh, <laughs> of which cork you, you end up getting. And when you're not making wine, how do you spend your time here? Uh, thinking about making wine. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <Jeez. laughs>